Hey everybody, so today I'm starting chapter three of A Christian Case Against Donald Trump, and this book is available on Amazon at the link below. Chapter three is called The Way of Truth versus The Way of the Deceiver. And let's just jump right into it with a section called Fifth Avenue Groomer. In my 2020 book about Donald Trump, I included a chapter called Hoax. Even back then, I tried to alert my readers to Trump's systematic assault on the truth. I highlighted one of his favorite tactics, labeling any facts that he doesn't like as either fake news or a hoax. And I asked, what happens to the Christian conscience when we willingly treat reality as a hoax and adopt the hoaxer as our prophet? We got our answer on January 6, 2021, when thousands of Trump supporters, many singing hymns and carrying Jesus signs, stormed the United States Capitol building. I asked that question long before Trump began his campaign of lies about the 2020 election, lies that directly led to that deadly assault in our democracy. None of what happened in the aftermath of the 2020 election should have surprised us. Trump showed us who he was from the start. Yet one of the most emotionally crushing aspects of the Trump era has been watching Christian pastors publicly support Trump. Rather than protect their people from his lies, they provide cover for a deceiver who launches daily attacks on the minds of their parishioners. Pastors of all people ought to understand the damage it does to human beings when we willingly suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Republican Senator Mitch McConnell said the following about the people Trump fooled. The people who stormed this building believed they were acting on the wishes and instructions of their president. And having that belief was a foreseeable consequence of the growing crescendo of false statements, conspiracy theories, and reckless hyperbole, which the defeated president kept shouting into the largest megaphone on planet Earth. For about five minutes after the Capitol attack, it looked like Christians might finally back off of their support for Trump. I even had several friends and family members tell me in early 2021 that they'd never vote for Trump again after what he'd done. But most of them support him now, once again. That's just another gut punch to those of us who hoped against hope that fomenting an insurrection might be a bridge too far for our Christian family and friends but it wasn't. Trump has learned an important lesson from the demagogues who've gone before him. Getting caught in one substantial lie or one public moral failure can derail the career of a highly respected politician. But for a candidate already known to be a reprobate and a con man, telling thousands of easily disproven lies or committing a scandal a week won't drive a single loyal follower away. We've all heard Trump say this. The people, my people are so smart. And you know what else they say about my people? The polls. They say, I have the most loyal people. Did you ever see that? Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. Sadly, he's right, and many of those voters, the ones that he so confidently assures us will never abandon him, identify as Christians. Trump's critics often talk about his lies and deceptions merely as a character issue, but that misses the larger point. Trump's Christian supporters aren't troubled by character issues. They rationalize problems of character away with a few trite phrases like, we all fall short, no one's perfect, God forgives him, and so do I. And Trump shows us every day that he understands this game. He knows voters already consider him morally reprehensible, so he plays into it as a strength. He's been so intentionally repugnant and transparently deceptive for so long that we've gotten used to it. And that gives him a sort of freedom that most candidates don't enjoy. He can be as nasty as he wants to be as a political strategy. He's groomed his followers to accept one lie, one act of abuse, then two, then a dozen, then a thousand more. 
Those who call him a pathological liar may be right, but it does no good to argue the point. It shifts the focus to a useless question. When do a person's lies add up to a pathology? I don't know. I don't care. Others with professional credentials can debate whether Trump is a pathological liar or a malignant narcissist or a sociopath or just a skilled political bad boy. What ought to matter to Christians is that he engages every day in a deliberate campaign of demagogic abuse and falsehoods. I needn't call Trump a pathological liar to point out his deceitful tactics. And I needn't call him a devil to point out his demonic strategies. Jesus dealt with people who waged a disinformation campaign against himself by saying this, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Trump is not the father of lies. That gives him far too much credit. He's more the uncle we never talk about of lies, the the one we don't lend money to anymore, the one we don't ask to babysit the kids, the one who, when we hear that he got arrested, causes us to wonder what took so long. Trump's lies aren't subtle. They're not meant to be. They're easily disproven by anyone who cares to check. The Washington Post has created a database of Trump's lies and misleading statements through the first four years of his presidency. Each entry links to documentation that reveals the dishonesty of each statement. Given the evidence available to each of us, it ought to be non-controversial to say that Trump has lied more than any other politician in America. This is from an article introducing the database. When the Washington Post fact-checker team first started cataloging President Trump's false or misleading claims, we recorded 492 suspect claims in the first 100 days of his presidency. On November 2nd alone, the day before the 2020 vote, Trump made 503 false or misleading claims as he barnstormed across the country in a desperate effort to win re-election. This astonishing jump in falsehoods is the story of Trump's tumultuous reign. By the end of his term, Trump had accumulated 30,573 untruths during his presidency, averaging about 21 erroneous claims a day. What is especially striking is how the tsunami of untruths kept rising the longer he served as president and became increasingly unmoored from the truth. We can't deny Donald Trump's intentional corruption of the truth, Yet Christians still support him. He makes absurd demands on the conscience of his listeners, demands that no follower of Jesus can accept, yet somehow they manage. So this chapter focuses on the most spiritually corrosive demand that Trump places on his listeners, that we accept his distorted, false, and toxic version of reality. Trump is doing to his followers what cult leaders do. He's feeding them lies and abuse every day, hoping to break down their moral defenses and to bypass their critical thinking. It's disappointing and unsettling to watch Christians fall for this. And it's enraging when their pastors and spiritual leaders cooperate with Trump against the conscience of their own people. Every time a powerful groomer gets exposed in a church. We find out soon enough that other leaders knew all along and even covered for the groomer. The capacity for exploitation is built into authoritarian systems, whether churches or national governments. And always, always, the path to exploitation is paved by weak leaders who protect their power by covering for the exploiter. So no, Trump hasn't shot anyone on Fifth Avenue, but he did sexually abuse a woman on Fifth Avenue, more specifically in the Bergdorf Goodman department store on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Remember that? E. Jean Carroll proved it in a court of law in front of a jury. And it turns out Donald Trump, the Fifth Avenue groomer, was right all along. Christians still love him just as much as we ever did. And he knows this about us. If he's groomed us to the point 
that will excuse sexual abuse? What are a few lies between friends? All right, if you found this video helpful, please share it with somebody. And if you buy the book, please leave a review on Amazon. And as always, thanks for listening.